Welcome back. I'm Ray Gibson from Art27. Art27 is a platform for artists, arts educators and arts organisations working in Europe and beyond. We're sharing stories, cultural programmes and raising awareness of the power of the arts as a force for social change and social inclusion. And today is November 16th, 2020, International Day for Tolerance and some fantastic projects and speakers Today, we've just been uh, hearing from uh, Dance for Beirut, and now we're joined by John Speyer uh, from Music in Detention. We'll hear from John in just a second. Um, a little reminder that we are streaming live on Facebook and YouTube, so if there are questions, you can write them in uh, the Facebook chat. We'll pick them up and do our best to answer. Uh, welcome, John, how are you? I'm okay, it's nice to be here, and thank you very much for inviting me. And uh, where are you today, uh, John? I'm at home, um, where I've been most of the last six months, you know, uh, in know. London, South London. In London. OK, yeah. very good, very good. Um, so please, can you give us a, a bit of an introduction to Music in Detention, how this started, which I think was in 2008, is that right? A bit earlier than that, actually. Even earlier, I'll, OK. I'll, I'll tell, yeah, I'll, I'll tell the story a little bit. Thanks. Um, yeah, so we've been around for about 15 years. The original pilot project was in 2005. Mm -hmm. We were set up by a group of people um, in somebody's memory. It was uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the the wife of one of our founders had died. And uh -huh. with, with money that was left in her estate, it was agreed by the family that they wanted to do things that this lady, Helen Tetlow, would have believed in and wanted to see and work with refugees and music were two passions of hers. And so that's where, the, that's in a sense where the idea came from. That was the genesis. But there were, there were, and there were a couple of, at least a couple of the people involved in setting mid up had got connections, family connections in their family histories mm. to Nazi concentration camps and Chilean prison camps in the Pinochet regime. Right. And there's sort of powerful stories about from both those uh, the, from both of those times about the power of music mm. um, for people in in places of confinement and in desperate situations. So uh, that kind of that kind of family history sort of fed into what became later on music in detention. So what we do is we take music making, participatory music making into immigration detention centers in the UK. And we run music projects with people who are detained in those centers. Right. Uh, we, we also use music as a way of connecting those, those people in detention to people who are outside detention, living in, uh, in the community nearby usually, um, sometimes further away. Um, but we particularly work to create connections with with groups in society who are also on the edge who are also marginalized stigmatized mm -hmm. uh, people who understand that life is a struggle and and they understand what it's like for everyone else to look down on you right um and we find that music's a really powerful way of of, of creating connections and empathy and understanding between those groups uh, and I, I stress between because I mean in both directions. Okay. Um, so in a nutshell, we're a, we're there to improve well-being and empathy and understanding, and those are essentially our sort of you know out, the outcomes we seek to mm -hmm. to have an impact on. Um, so let's see. There are. There are uh, currently seven immigration removal centres in the UK. We're, I believe, the only country in Europe to have no time limit on detention. And that's certainly one of the things that makes detention a very uh, troubling, very uh, traumatizing experience. And and, just sorry to interrupt, yeah, uh, John. Sure, uh, sure. This is new terminology to, to me because I'm not as well informed, um, frankly. Mm -hmm. So I, I hear probably like many others in the news, um, terms like uh, camps and uh, 
mm. all these things. But this is, you know, one of the first times I've been hearing this word detention, you know, because right. as, as I grew up in the UK, a detention center was like a naughty boys home. And it was, mm. it was like, uh, basically a prison. Um, and that, well, that it, yeah. phrase is being used here too then. Mm. Well, immigration detention is a relatively new thing. Obviously, prisons have been around for a very long time. And in many ways, the prison system is is a much more, you know, has huge problems of its own. But it is, in mm. some respects, in many respects, a more mature system. The immigration detention system, I mean, until the 1990s, there were just these centres where a few hundred people might be. But no. but uh, in, the, in the 90s, and especially the 2000s, you know, it grew to a system that, had, let's see, there were about 11 detention centers. Mm -hmm. um, it's now down to seven, um, plus short term holding facilities of various kinds. It's a bit, it's, there's lots of tech, technical detail here, which I'll try not to sort of bore That's you with. Okay. And I'm not an, not an expert on it anyway. But, you know, at its peak, the system was able to detain 4,000 people at a time. Right. And, and are these people coming? um into the country and waiting to be housed and start a life in the uk or are they people who are being detained ready to send back to somewhere else or well is it a mixture yeah well it's a whole it's a whole mixture you know but uh we're talking about let's see i think the average number of people detained in a year from mm -hmm. to, to 2009 to 2018 if i remember yeah. correctly is about twenty eight thousand. so this is a big yeah. system that's yeah something worth noting there are a lot few this year things have changed a lot in all sorts of in in a number of really important ways because of the pandemic and other things as well and we can talk mm. about that later but it's been a so it's a prison like system yeah with important similarities to prison and important differences to prison but essentially these are prison like establishments locked doors you know barbed wire right, right. okay secure environments yeah and the people in them uh, are all are all defined by the government as foreign nationals. I'm choosing my words carefully. Mm -hmm. um, so some of them are people who just who recently arrived in the country, and as in the back of a lorry, or now in a small boat, mm -hmm. or um, or whatever. Many of them, many of those people will be claiming asylum, but not all of them. Um, there will be people who. Um, who've been in the country for for a number of years with an asylum claim that's still not resolved because those take years often. Yeah. Um, there will be people who have done time in prisons in the UK and then government policies essentially that most of those people should be then deported at the end of, after their sentences have finished. So having done, having done the sentence, they then continue to be held um, under immigration rules pending deportation. A lot of those people are the ones who spend the longest time in detention because the cases are very complicated. Yeah. Um, but those people, this is important to know, those people include a lot of people who have grown up in the UK. So we are not just mm. talking about recent arrivals. We're talking about people who came here with their families as young children. They've no. grown up here. English is their, you know, effectively their first language. They yeah. have families here. They've been to school and college and They've worked friends, and they've had kids of their yeah. own, lots of connections. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe they never went to the country their family were from. Maybe they went for only on a holiday, you know, that kind of thing. And then they get into trouble. Something happens, you know, they get, get into a spot of bother, shall we say, you know, rain, all sorts of different crimes, you know, mm -hmm. obviously some serious, some not. Um, and then they're, they're classified as a foreign national offender. Right. And then in addition, we've seen the Windrush scandal, which um, I don't know if everybody on this no, session knows about it, but this is people who came, pe people who came from the Caribbean to mm. Britain, their families and they're with their families in the 40s and 50s at the invitation of the British government and are, are legally resident in the UK and have spent their lives here and contributed and so on and so forth. And then due to various things that happened in the immigration system and the government, um, they started to get caught up in government policy of a hostile environment towards migrants. Mm. And people started to be asked to prove their right to reside here 
and in some cases were detained and in some cases were deported. It's mm. been a huge political so scandal. Got a whole mix of people yeah. with different backgrounds and different yeah. tensions. And um, thanks for, for explaining that because it's not always clear. Uh, certainly no, no, not it's, me, it, and, uh, it's, it's, it's little so known far, by, yeah. you know, it's little known and that in, it, mm. across society really, there aren't that, you know, people just haven't heard of it or if they've heard right. of it, they don't really know what mm. it is. It's a quite a secretive system. So one of our aims, I suppose, is to is to bring it more into the public eye. Yeah, got it. And uh, there's a painting you wanted to share with us, I think. Is yeah. that? Um, could you tell us what this is? Well, so this is um, this is from that 2008. Um, mm -hmm. We did some. We were working at that time at a detention centre in an old naval barracks on the south coast in a town called Gosport near Portsmouth. And there was a guy in there um, from Poland, Zbigniew was his name. Mm -hmm. And he really got into, he did some music stuff with us and he really got into art and he did a lot of art. He did a lot of stuff in the art room at this center. And he produced this painting, which whose title was Music in Detention. Oh. And um, I use this sometimes just as a very, I just think it's such an eloquent portrayal of our work and essentially, um, Beautiful, it's part yeah. documentary and part fantasy, but the fantasy part is, to me, communicates what the sessions meant to him. So there are people, uh, there are people in the, in the foreground of the painting who are, there are actual people, there's a member of staff, detention, there's a t detention officer there in his white short sleeve shirt. Yeah, of our just behind the and, saxophone. Yeah. yeah, there's a guy playing the saxophone, he's one of our artists, or was at the mm. time, and and then there are some guys in the foreground doing their thing. And those are guys who were in the center. They are people detained. But then the further away you get from that foreground, the more kind of other things you see. There's mm -hmm. a few celebrity celebrity participants. Yeah, people might notice see. Freddie Mercury. Indeed, yeah. And uh, is John Lennon in there? I think John Lennon's in there and, mm -hmm. and B.B. King. So that's great. We love okay. that. And so then the bit I love the most is yeah. is the dancing in the background, the walls sort of breaking down, yeah, disappearing, melting. And then away. there's this enigmatic yeah. angel holding the whole, holding the, the the canvas as it were up, or putting it out, or as somebody once pointed out to me, they might be taking it in. Mm. And to me, I don't know. People people will have different. It's always lovely to talk about this with people because. Every time I do it, somebody spots something or see, sees something in the picture that I've not seen yeah. or heard. But it's a um, striking image. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, thanks. So for it, you know, I have a sense of the sort of inner freedom that can come. I think, mm. and, you know, which in so much evaluation, we do lots of evaluation. We talk to people and ask them what what the music making meant to them. What that you know, what did you like? What didn't you like? What difference did it make? That's our. If, yeah, you know, we can see inside someone's head in yeah. a nutshell, and yeah. they tell us amazing things about their lives. It's another opportunity for voice, as is you know, music making and lyric writing and so on and so forth. And yeah. and this thing of this sense of you how you feel inside yourself is is what comes out so often, and that's what to me this mm. picture expresses. So it's a great it's a great sort of example of what the work inside the centres can do. Right. And then we have the video. Should we go to the video? Because the video is the other side of the work, the work mm -hmm. in the community. Yeah, let's um, show that now. That would be great. Yeah, so if I can just introduce it briefly. So we did a we did a project with a group of young people at a youth centre in West London, um, which was about a mile or two from Heathrow Airport, where there are two detention centres, and we were working at one of those centres. So we had a project where the detain where we ran sessions with the detainees. And we ran sessions with the group in the community and and the artists um, went back and forth between the two groups. So the artists, are, this is where um, peace building comes in. Mm -hmm. The artists go back and forth. So each time they're with the young people, they're going, well, let's play you the stuff we recorded at the centre the last time we were there, which was yesterday or last week or whatever. And the same back at the centre. So the two groups, they don't meet physically. I mean, the, if it's young people, they, there's no way they would be allowed into a detention centre anyway if they're not adults. Mm, okay. Um, but they have this rather special thing where they're in their own group, they're in their own room, if you like, but they're hearing all this amazing stuff from a group that they've never met before. Somewhere else, yeah. Um, 
And so it's an encounter, it's a social encounter, it's, a, it's social bonding, but it's through the creative experience. And creatively, it's a collaboration. So you create stuff, you send it to the other group, they do something to it, they add to it, they put another track and down, keep or, building, they, yeah. you know, or add a verse, or, or make, create something of their own in response. And so they're building up this body of work, and your own stuff it comes back to you, and it's still your, it's like, change but it's still yours it's a sort of joint ownership let's of um, this let, let's theory. roll the video because i'm just conscious of time so okay, uh, thanks sure. for making the introduction let's let's show that now if we may sure. yeah and sure. our wonderful tech team will thank you stream it as well <laughs> project have bring a lot of difference and in the life of these young people some of them were really lacking of motivation and things to do and thanks to this project they are kind of now more inspired and they're ready to kind of take on board different opportunities this is with the older group like it's more mentoring so now they feel like they have that skill as well and confidence i feel in general with the little kids it have bring them more confidence to speak up wherever they feel instead of just just playing all the time they, they're starting to be a bit more mature all i seem to see is hardships and struggles people taking drugs and committing crimes different roads same old troubles that's why i choose to write the best part of the project was writing the lyrics and like me and everyone else went and listening to that like tracks back Highlights of the project for me would be just kind of group cohesion. Um, started off with very different people, um, different age groups, um, but along the way we've kind of worked with different sets of people and made things that they want to listen to which makes them more even more involved and you can see the confidence that people have got from week one to um, week three. I couldn't believe it but they're looking at the mother's ring but then they had to go away and they're trying to fly away they're trying to get away for the day they're trying to change their lives but they're seeing it in their eyes every time they see I it. I think it was so meaningful they so like and it's how they're feeling in, like being in there and um, like feeling trapped, so I don't know, like not seeing family and stuff like that. It's it's a bit it's a bit hard for them to be honest. Together as a group, found that there's people that are in a situation that are kind of trying to reach out and voice through their music, and for them to be able to have people on the outside who are hearing their music or trying to say something back, it's like a really good thing, like to have. You know, they don't really have our people to speak to, so for us to be able to communicate even through music, such a little small sort of thing, goes a long way. It's helping young people like express their feelings and it's, it's a lot better than just like uh, swearing and like put it, like cussing people out and stuff. There's a lot more potential in young people than I first perceived there to be. Inspiring, that's the word, because that's what has brought to the life of the young people I work with, inspiration. Getting young people here to recognise um, what an immigration movement is and empathise with what people are going through there 
and kind of you know writing lyrics based upon that because the response from the uh, detainees has been really positive and they really appreciate what's come from here and in return they've recorded some amazing things. <laughs> Okay, John, thanks for sharing that. Um, so I'm happy that you're going to join our panel discussion in about 10 or 15 minutes as well. But I think it's worth wrapping up this section for your project for music in detention to just talk about intolerance and, and tolerance specifically. Um, can you tell us what intolerance you've seen over these 12, 15 years working on this? And it's very unfair to ask you to do this in a couple of minutes, but mm. if we could touch on this, it would be great. Yeah, what intolerance I've seen. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I think the short answer is probably less than you might think. Okay, yeah. Um, and, the re and I think I've got a, an idea of what the reason might be. I mean, the most, the most outstanding example of intolerance was actually from a conversation I had with a, one of the detention centre managers. And this is not at all representative of detention centre managers. I'm not going to, it was very much this individual, not the group as a whole. Mm -hmm. But he said to me once that it was, he felt, it was curious to me why he felt it necessary to say to me, to, to say to me that he felt that immigration detention was necessary because of the, because the country was being, uh, because there were so many migrants coming to the country and he quoted some enormous figure that was, you know, one of these sort of myths that was floating mm -hmm. around at the time, you know, as many people as live in Birmingham or, you know, one of those kinds of right, things. Right. Mm. And 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 um, 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 so that does sort of jump out in my memory since you asked the question. Mm. But the thing that the thing the thing that um, jumps out from the work we do in the community is that people have a lot of misconceptions. There's a lot of ignorance. There's a lot of anxiety. There's I mean, when I say ignorance, I mean people just don't know mm. what is going on in other people's lives. And so we've, we've certainly had, in groups that we've worked with in the community, we've certainly had people expressing attitudes that wouldn't fit with our values, but we sort of encourage that because if people can't speak, you, how do you work with them? I mean, you have to get yeah. it out in the open. It's about how you do that. It's all, you know? Mm. So we are there to um, create a space where people feel comfortable, safe, able to express themselves and where they feel valued by us if we don't do any if we don't achieve that then we can't make any impact on people's attitudes mm. you just put people's backs up you're not going to get anywhere basically so you get quite a lot of you hear quite a lot that seems to me to come from the way that immigration is so often discussed which is it's a sort of theoretical issue or not theoretical exactly but abstract it's this big political thing about migration or immigration and asylum and and it gets batted around and the, there are you know it's sort of shared messaging you yeah. know social media down the pub politicians yeah. and this stuff sort of circulates around and the impact we're trying to have on it i suppose is to insert some real first-hand experience to overcome the them, with... them and does kind of thinking yeah uh, and be more inclusive and, and you're creating yeah. that safe space to to be tolerant and to exactly listen so, and, and understand so yeah. yeah exactly and and what we find is that among the people that we work with there is this immense capacity for solidarity mm. and empathy but yeah. it needs it needs an experience to 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 that can that can put something new into somebody's thinking mm. good yeah create that spark and, and let it run yeah excellent yeah and out of so paradoxically it's the safe space where things that we might not want to hear individually can be expressed it's through through that safety that you can actually uh do something that might 
reduce mm. that, reduce those attitudes. Right. Yeah, so um, there's some notes that I've uh, saved just um, ahead of today's talk. This is a, um, a kind of positive tolerance uh, characterized as positive evaluation, appreciation and support of differences and diversity. This is a quote from Mum and Day and Wenzel from 1999, uh, which was shared by the UN. So uh, mm. yeah, as opposed to negative tolerance, which is just kind of putting up with people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is actually I, you yeah. know, understanding and educating. Yeah, I'm not I suppose I'm not wildly keen on the word tolerance, but it's because I, okay. I kind of it speaks more to I don't know the way I read the word. It's more the negative than the positive. Right. You know, That's like true, isn't it? Up. If if you tolerate something, it, it, it is also a kind of a synonym for putting up with something. Yeah. Isn't it? That's true. Yeah. yeah. And it but, has yeah. a sort of history. I think it has a history in Western Europe that's about the toleration of minorities, like allowing them mm. beneficently to sort of be present in society, as it were. So there's a okay. kind of political baggage for me with the word. But, mm. um, you know, toleration, I don't know, of Catholics or Jews or Muslims. Mm. Or, you know, well, let's, let's do the word toleration a favour together and let's say that proactive toleration is a great thing. I I, and, yeah, and that, we can create I've safe spaces and tolerance much more. Thank you. There you go. <laughs> a, a positive finish. So um, let's uh, pause there, John, and we'll we'll welcome you back for our panel discussion in uh, about eight minutes. Thank you very uh, much. We'll also Thank be you. joined by two other guests, and uh, we'll go deeper into these themes of, yeah. uh, of tolerance today. I look Thanks. forward to it. All right.